This episode has been brought to you by Fantara and Connect. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to the hosts of Candidates Unfiltered, Shawana Cashel. Hello, hello, hello. She's a trailblazing advocate for equity and humanitarian leadership. With a steadfast commitment to equity, justice, and the embrace of diversity, she stands as a remarkable figure in the global landscape. She is not only a distinguished UN Assistant Secretary General, but also an ordained Baptist preacher weaving principles of compassion and respect into her multifaceted journey. Help me welcome Sarah Besloyenti. Please have a seat. All right, I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> Sarah's unyielding dedication to fostering positive change has been a defining hallmark throughout her illustrious career. Her achievements span across international borders and crisis-ridden regions. Are you ready for Candidates Unfiltered? Yes! Okay, so welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you for having me. So today is going to be... Today is going to be fun. We're not talking politics, even though you're a politician. We're not talking about that today. We're just going to have a little bit of fun. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> so let's start off with a bit of quick yeses and noes. Okay. Okay. So, shy. No. Life of the party. No. <laughs> Will you stand up for others before standing up for yourself? Yes. Do you prefer sleep over work? <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you prefer driving instead of flying? No. Do you like cooking more than eating? Yes. <laughs> Are you a hopeless romantic? No. <laughs> All right, let's give it up for her. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, so I thought I would just start off with some fun, quick questions and whatnot, but today we're going to really get to know you a little bit deeper than politics, or a lot deeper than politics. Um, so the first question I have, the picture that we have on the monitor now is a picture of you at the beach, young Sarah at the beach. Um, do you have any childhood memories that have significantly shaped who you are today? Yes, for sure. Um, several. One of the memories that stands out for me is my grandmother, mm. my maternal grandmother. Um, and the fact that all around me, I was aware she was feeding people. She was a dietitian. She was a cook. Okay. And she fed so many young people and managed to take care of her children as a single mom. She, she was widowed very, very young. Wow. That shaped a lot of my thinking around how people should take care of other people. Right. I also then have in my mind very clearly lack Mm. I had lack in the midst of much. All right, tell me a little bit about that. And it comes from a place of having a checkerboard uh, childhood. Checkerboard childhood in terms of living in different places, living mm -hmm. with different people, um, because my parents were trying to get the best life for us. But my mother and father went in different directions. And so I've lived with my grandmother, lived with aunts, lived with my mother, lived with my father. And those have their own di dynamics. And so at different points in time, I didn't always have what I needed. Yeah. And that also shaped for me um, the importance of ensuring equity, ensuring uh, fairness and access to rights. Right, of course. So I'm assuming your grandmother was probably one of your role models. For sure. Yeah. Were there any others? Yes. <laughs> uh, my mother was a role model. Okay. My mother is one of the strongest people I know. Um, role model from the perspective of work, drive, mm -hmm. persistence, and overcoming obstacles. Nothing kept her down, yeah. no matter what the difficulties were. She, there were times where she worked three jobs, and I, wonder, I used to try to add it up, the hours in the day, how she did it. So that tenacity and that drive, for sure, I've always admired it. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. Uh, so your teenage years, I found some pictures of you as a teenager. This is with, I guess, two of your friends. Can you tell me, you know, back then, like, what were some of the experiences and adventures you had as a young teen? So firstly, let me say that picture 
-hmm. is with two of my classmates in CWA. One of them passed away last year. Oh, sorry. She died very young. Um, but it was African Costume Day, as it was called back then. Okay. And that within itself it has a lot to do with what shaped my pan-African ideology. Wow. The fact that in Liberia, Africa's oldest republic, we had a day called African Costume Day. Mm. Our traditional way is not a costume. Right, right, exactly. And the fact that we had a period in our history where it was seen as a costume. Um, but that day was a day where we dressed up in our African mm -hmm. clothes and tried to look the prettiest and tried to be different and so forth and so on. And um, yeah, that's what, that's what I remember when I, when I look when at that look picture. When look at that picture, yeah. And my teenage years were shaped with responsibility would be what comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Responsibility for younger siblings. Okay. Responsibility for younger cousins. Um, but then in terms of friendships, some really good friendships that have lasted yeah. from then till now. Wow. So are you in your family? Are you, how many siblings do you have? We're five. Um, from my mom, but both for my mom and my father, I'm the eldest. Okay, so now I understand the responsibilities. <laughs> okay, so now as, um, you know, can you share like a pivotal life lesson you learned during your teenage years that continue to guide you today? Managing emotions. Mm, how so? Managing emotions because there was a time when, there was a day where I felt I was being taken advantage of. I was being ill-treated. And that day, my reaction was bad. My reaction was, it was physical oh. to the point where I could have hurt somebody that day because I was so badly mistreated. I was ill and I was being deprived food by somebody. Ah. And I got angry. I got angry to the extent where I realized that if I were to go further in acting on my emotions, I could have hurt somebody that right. day. And it taught me a lesson that you never let your emotions get to the point where you can, you can do something bad. Of course, I didn't do anything bad that yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, but you thought it. I thought it. And you felt that that was bad I thought enough. it and I yeah. felt it. Mm -hmm. And I realized the risks that we have if we don't manage um, our emotions. But... Um, I'm grateful to God that mm -hmm. I don't have the problem of anger. Yeah. But also it's led me to bottle a lot of my emotions, which is not good as well. Right, right, right. So I will easily shed tears if I'm happy or if I'm sad and so forth. But other types of emotions, you probably, you probably never knew I have them. Interesting. I've, heard, I've asked that question, question multiple times and I've never heard managing emotions. Pretty deep. Okay. Well, let's get a little personal. So first, love and relationships. Now, reflecting on your first love, what valuable lessons did you experience? Did that experience teach you about relationships and self-discovery? I think what, what I can take from that, um, from that experience would be that we don't really know love at that age. Mm -hmm. That is true. <laughs> I learned that we don't know love at that age. We're experiencing uh, emotions that are undefined at that time. You right. think you know what it is, yeah. but you realize that you really don't know what it is. And what that taught me is uh, the fact also that what you feel, um, you may define as something, but somebody else may feel something similar, define it totally differently. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so communication and understanding mm -hmm. people's perspectives yeah. of what love is, mm -hmm. is important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So before we go to our next question, please, we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. <laughs> My perceptions of what love and marriage was supposed to be. Mm. I feel that it, and, and I ended up with multiple marriages. At Connect Services Liberia, we provide high speed internet and data communication. We ensure fast, reliable, and stable wireless connectivity. With our services, we've helped customers, small businesses, enterprises, and NGOs with reliable internet connectivity. We would love to help you grow your business. Call us today. Frontera Wines, one of the best and affordable imported wines in Liberia. For 18 and older, drink responsibly. 
candidates unfiltered, the person, not the politics. Welcome back. So we talked about your first lessons in love. Now I have another question for you. So how did you navigate the challenge of young love and personal growth while in your young adult life? <laughs> I made a lot of mistakes. Yeah. I made a lot of mistakes. And it goes back to my previous, my previous response in terms of what love is mm -hmm. and seeking for love. And I think it differs for everyone. It depends on what your environment is yeah. growing up and what you're looking for mm -hmm. um, growing up. And balancing the quest for a family unit yeah. with the quest for love, with the quest to meet an ideal mm. wow. um, was extremely difficult. And so because of that, I failed. Yeah. I failed at it, and, and I ended up with multiple marriages. However, I landed at a place where, where yes, yeah. I'm whole. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you know, I feel you because I was in the same place, so I totally relate to that. Um, so what qualities do you believe have contributed to your strength of your marriage or partnership? And then how do you maintain that bond amidst your busy schedule? So Steve and Yanti and I have been married now for 22 years. And we've been together 23 years. And what has kept us together, I think, from my side, mm -hmm. is my ability to adjust my perceptions of what love and marriage was supposed to be mm. because I saw so much of brokenness and I was looking for this thing that didn't exist. And when I understood that what I thought it should be didn't exist, I was able to then with him shape what yeah. we both could agree on having. Yeah. Yeah. So if you were to tell a young woman one thing that could help to sustain or keep their marriage healthy, what would that be? Agreeing on what your parameters are. Okay. Okay. Agreeing on what the compromises are. Mm. And meeting each other halfway. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I agree with you. I agree with you. Wonderful. So let's. But that's after failure. That's after failure. Yeah. But that's you got to learn from failure. it, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so motherhood and parenthood. Let's talk about that. So motherhood is a transformative journey. Um, how has becoming a mother influenced your outlook on life and your priorities? So I will link this to the previous question because I didn't answer one part of it, okay. which was the issue of how we maintained. Um, but I, I really wanted to speak to that in sure. light of the career mm -hmm. with moving around in so many places. And I can't leave this interview without stating this because if I didn't have a husband who supported me 100%, there's no way I would have reached the level of UN Assistant Secretary General. Mm. Because in spite of the attacks he received, the ridicule he received in saying that he was following a woman and a, yeah. a real man wouldn't follow a woman and so forth. He resigned his job to go with me. And if he hadn't done that, the peace of mind I had to commit myself to my work as I did, yeah. um, I wouldn't have had it. Yeah. I would have been fighting other battles. Did you, feel, did you feel guilty about him resigning his job for you? Not then. I do now. Okay. Why? Not then. But now I do because... He sacrificed so much. And at the age he is now, he can't say he's re-entering into that workspace. So all he can do now is, you know, private business and so forth and work on things that we do personally and get some consulting here now, maybe that. But he did sacrifice yeah. a lot. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that because so much Absolutely. E effort is spent in talking about gender and women's participation and women's mm -hmm. leadership in the role of women and so forth. And we don't spend much time talking about those men who actually do stand behind women. And yeah. 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 And I, I, I then link that to the next one on then the children. Children, yeah. The children. Because we were a, or are, we, we evolved from mm -hmm. a checkerboard <laughs> type of situation into this beautiful family that we have now. Um, the children did go through a lot. Yeah. They did go through a lot, and they dif the, the experiences were different for them based on their own perspectives as well. Of course, yeah. So what one child felt was amazing, another child felt led them to not really have strong relationships because they were moving all the time. Yeah. 
Every time they made friends and establishing strong relationships, we had to move mm. again. Another one, but another child felt that was the best part of it. Right. We got to go to so many countries. So sacrifices were made by the children as well. Yeah. And I do acknowledge that. And we do talk about it. We've, we've grown so much because of it. Um, and in spite of it, we found a way to work through it, but definitely for sure, um, there have been some pains in terms of the sacrifices they had to make yeah. and what that did to me as a mother, knowing that yeah, of course. they had those pains uh, because of the, the, the work that I did. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I'm just, let me go on into my interview because I'm kind of feeling you. <laughs> so balancing a demanding career and parenthood can be challenging. So how do you find harmony between professional and personal roles, right? Easy. Tell Very me. Easy. Tell me. Easy. So I can give you a typical day when all of us were together. Now we have grown children with grandchildren. We have three and a half grandchildren. Okay. Th so, did you say half? Yeah, because she's pregnant. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait a minute. My daughter is pregnant. So Wonderful. Congratulations. In September, will be, there will be four grandchildren in okay. September. Three girls and a boy mm -hmm. um, by, by mid-September. Wow. But um, on a typical day, I'll give you a typical day where we're all at home before, okay. everybody, before anybody left home. Okay. A typical day outside of uh, Liberia at the time where I would come home, make cornbread or shortbread and, and so forth. Um, whatever light thing we wanted, we all share it, watch TV together crack up laughing at movies and so forth. But then I'm on the computer at the same time and in between and making sure I meet deadlines, but also making sure that spend I meet time. Um, the requirement to, to be able to spend time with them. Yeah, that's, that sounds exactly like my life right now. So we, we need to talk a little bit more about this. So in life now, you're a public figure, right? We're talking about navigating the public life now. Um, fabrications about individuals in public eye is not uncommon. What have you ever encountered someone just blatantly lying about you? And how did you deal with that? Recently, just mm. very recently, since I took my early retirement from the UN, okay. which is just June 30th. Okay. Uh, some journalist, somebody um, got up and said that I left the UN because I had to leave. I couldn't go back. Um, I ran away from the UN. And, um, and because of that, um, Madam Salif put me into politics wow. and, <laughs> and I smiled and you won't imagine that the week they did that is a week where I got a request to please reconsider coming back. Wow. <laughs> wow. And so, um, how I responded to that, I said nothing. Mm. I didn't you react. your battles. I didn't react. Yeah. Um, because it's important for, for people to know that sensationalizing and, 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 you know, misinformation, disinformation, and so forth. Not everybody will react to it. And they want to see you hurt. Yes. yes. I also had a situation where I'm a reverend. I'm an ordained Baptist reverend. And somebody put on time on social media that I was preaching prostitution. Mm. Yes. I was preaching, preaching wow. prostitution. And they did it just because someone close to me had an situation with them mm -hmm. and they felt that if they did that to me that would hurt that person mm. so they used me as a scapegoat just to get to that person they sent me an inbox and said i did that so you'd call your dogs off of me tell you tell you tell your sons not to wow. attack me wow. so you have those kinds of things that happen they are different kinds of attacks you receive in the yeah. public space um you have to be very clear about what you will touch and what you won't touch right and you have to be intentional about it yeah Good point, good point. Okay, so this is getting good. Let's talk more after this commercial break. Up next. Yeah. I had someone say to me in Yemen, you're going to fail here in Yemen because you're a woman, you're African, you're black. Frontera Wines, one of the best and affordable imported wines in Liberia. For 18 and older, drink responsibly. At Connect Services Liberia, we provide high-speed internet and data communication. We ensure fast, reliable, and stable wireless connectivity. With our services, we've helped customers, small businesses, enterprises, and NGOs with reliable internet connectivity. We would love to help you grow your business. Call us today. Candidates Unfiltered, the person, not the politics. 
Welcome back. We've covered so much already, and I'm really enjoying Sarah Bezloyenti, uh, her story. Now, before we move on, I'd like to know a few more things about you. This is a game that my kids tend to play with me. It's called Would You Rather. So, would you rather have your dream job and be unable to retire in 50 years or have a terrible job but get to retire in 10 years? I would rather have the dream job. The dream, dream job. Okay. Would you rather have a terrible boss but have a great job or a great job but a terrible boss? Great job and terrible boss. <laughs> okay. Would you rather do something you love and make just enough money to get by or do something you hate but make billions of dollars? <laughs> well, you see me leaving being a UN Assistant Secretary General to come and enter into a political yeah. race. So we know the answer. <laughs> We know the answer. Okay, so would you rather eat the oldest thing in the office fridge or clean the office bathroom with toilet paper? Clean the office bathroom with mm, toilet paper. Me too, right there with you. <laughs> would you rather have a name everyone misspells or a name everyone forgets? <laughs> we'll talk about that afterwards. <laughs> um, but a name everyone misspells maybe. Then forgetting. Then forgetting. I don't want to be forgettable either. Would you rather be known for your intelligence or your good looks? Intelligence. Intelligence. All right. So I knew you would say that. <laughs> Give it up for her. <laughs> okay. So now, with your visibility comes admiration and criticism. How do you manage your emotional well-being and resilience in the face of public scrutiny? I, I compartmentalize. I was just saying to you earlier yeah. during the break, I have boxes. Yeah. I have boxes. I put things in boxes and I lock them up and I choose when to open them. Wow. And that's how I've been able to survive. Spending three years in Yemen mm -hmm. um, and dealing with the Iran-backed Houthis, yeah. I had to have boxes. Ebola, fighting Ebola in Nigeria and being at the forefront of Ebola, I had to have boxes. So I've learned to live with boxes and I put things in different boxes or compartments and I just close them up when I'm ready to deal with them. I open them mm -hmm. up and deal with them and I choose yeah. what to deal with and when to deal with them. When you're dealing with high demand roles, it's so public at that mm -hmm. and you're managing and leading huge teams in conflict contexts or in very vulnerable and fragile contexts, you don't have time to feel. You just have time to get the information, the data points, you analyze, you take decisions, and you feel later. Yeah, that's pretty deep. So I have to ask you this. You know, being a woman in this man's world that we live in, has there been any time where someone blatantly said something to you because you're a woman that was extremely negative and maybe degrading? So I wish we had a totally different show just for that topic. <laughs> I could do an hour on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had someone say to me in Yemen, you're going to fail mm. as a leader here in Yemen because you're a woman, you're African, you're black. Wow. You're a Christian and you're an imperialist mm. because I was heading a UN entity. Yeah. And that was at the beginning. You're told nothing's possible because of who you are. Did it break you? It sure didn't break me. Absolutely not. I didn't think so. The fact is it was stronger. <laughs> yeah. Because I got to prove to them that my ability to lead and to achieve results is not, is not measured by the color of my skin or whether or not I'm a male or female. It's, it's determined by my capacity and my competencies. And I succeeded in Yemen. Oh, man. I succeeded. That is awesome. I, I just had to throw that question in there because I'm curious. <laughs> so now, looking ahead, what legacy do you hope to leave behind, both, public, uh, both as a public figure and as an individual who has touched countless lives? Well, then you've merged two questions. In yes, one. I have. <laughs> because that's why I've entered into political mm -hmm. race. When you've had the blessing that I've had to join the UN as a contractor, at the first level, national officer level one, mm. as a contractor, then to become a national officer as a staff, and then to grow through every single level and step and become UN Assistant Secretary General from the bottom of development to the top. 
and you reach 55, yeah. and you realize you have 10 to 15 more years of active work, what do you do at that point? Mm. It's all about legacy. Yes. And legacy is impacting. Legacy is about taking all that you know, all that you've experienced, and making sure it impacts as many people as possible. Where would I do that if not in my own country? Right. Right. And that's why I'm in this space. And I joined at this time because it's a pivotal point. Yeah. It was the age where you can take early retirement at the UN. It was now or then go through for many more years. Yeah. And I would ask myself the question with the situation in Liberia now. What will posterity say? Mm -hmm. And I want to be a part of Liberia's transformation. And I decided that now is the time. Right. And that's about legacy building. Legacy building yeah. is not your name. Legacy building is transferring knowledge and skills and impacting as many people as possible. And right. that's what this is about yeah. for me. So earlier on, you said, now that you're a politician, I refuse that word because I've entered into a political space. But I'm a minister. You're a minister. Mm -hmm. I'm a minister of the purpose called by God for transformation and deliverance. Mm -hmm. And that's what mm -hmm. I retract my statement. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So I have to operate in a political space, but I pray to never become a politician because the definition of a politician is people who just say rhetorics and do whatever yeah. to get power. For me, this is not about power or position. If that was the case, I would stay in the UN or when they call me two weeks later, I would have gone back. Right. right. This is about a process and a people. Mm -hmm. This is about how we impact the political culture yes. to change what has been known to be and to, to, to lift it up to a place where we make it about the people. Yeah. The nation Liberia. Yeah. The country Liberia is from the nation Liberia. The country is a territory, is systems, and so forth, the 43,000 square miles. Right. The nation mm. is the diversity and beauty of all the people we have within this, the 43,000 square miles. It's amazing. And I want to impact those people by reducing poverty, yeah. by ensuring that they, they, they know that they have alternatives. Many people, before I joined the race, said to me, I don't think I'll vote. Mm. I, don't, I haven't seen an option or alternative. Okay. And maybe many people yeah. won't vote for me. That's left for the Liberian people to decide. But let Liberian people know that this is not all they have. They have much more than that. Yeah. And they should be doing much more than this. Yes. And they should be much more than what we've given them. And that's what I want to do. Yeah. That's why I'm in the race. That is amazing. <laughs> you answered my last question. <laughs> you did. Sarah's journey is a tapestry woven with threads of resilience, innovation, and a fierce dedication to the betterment of humanity. As a presidential candidate in Liberia, a UN leader, and the beacon of hope for countless communities, she exemplifies the power of an individual driven by values and committed to leaving a legacy of compassion and progress. Thank you. <laughs> Once again, thank you for coming and being a part of this show. Did you guys enjoy it? I completely enjoyed having you on the show. And to all of our viewers out there, remember, behind every candidate is a human being with a story to tell. That was awesome. Thank you so, so much for being here. You are amazing. <laughs> so Join us next week for another raw and unfiltered look into the lives of our candidates. I have friends who I've known since high school, and we're still friends still today. Candidates Unfiltered, the person, not the politics. This episode has been brought to you by Frontera and Connect.